Praise Jesus, Brother Zen. God bless you. So happy to have you back on. Always an honor, brother. Glad to be here with the fellowship and the family. Yeah, amen. I'm real excited about the consulting gig that I I got uh, queued up for the end of this month. I'll hopefully get to come over to your house and, and give you a big Jesus hug. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that, brother. That's a wonderful blessing. Yeah, I guess I shouldn't bring my two big boxers along with me since you're a kitty cat fan. Uh, I don't think my four persons <laughs> could like that very much. <laughs> Praise God, Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, Amen. Hey, um, yeah, I guess, uh, I guess, with the uh, lions laying down with the lambs in heaven, we won't have to worry about that when we ascend upward to our uh, glorified state. Praise God. Yeah, no, not at all. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, so let me read this. Uh, I covered this very briefly uh, during the last show, and uh, let me read this little uh, excerpt uh, from your book. It's a quote from the Lost Book of Enki, um, and this is uh, uh, what many of the uh, proponents of the Anunnaki being the original creators of man, the original creators of Adam and Eve, uh, in the Garden of Eden, they spelled it E-D-I-N, and they called you know their version of Adam, Adamo, or whatever, and all of these you know various quote, experts out there are, you know, creating YouTube videos, DVDs, and telling the whole world that mankind was created by these fallen angels, these Anunnaki. Uh, And in the Lost Book of Enki, it says, and I quote, Indeed, a wonder of wonders it is. A new breed of earthling on earth has emerged. A civilized man has the earth itself brought forth. Farming and shepherding, crafts and tool making, can he be taught? So was Enlil to Enki, saying, Let us of the new breed to Anu word send. Of the new breed word to Anu on Nibiru was beamed. Let seeds that can be sown, let ewes that sheep become to earth be sent. So did Enki and Enlil to Anu the suggestion made, By civilized man, let Anunnaki and earthlings become satiated. So what was it in this text that made you say, aha, that is a twist on reality, and what really happened? Can you expand on this? Sure. Um, The thing that I I had studied, even before I got into the Word, um, I had read most of the Sumerian texts, and I had already read all of Zechariah Sitchin's works before I had ever got into reading the scripture, and uh, I mean on a profound level in the way that I have as far as uh, the past few years, because I've consumed everything that I can find now uh, pertaining to the Word, the extra biblical books, the pseudepigraphal, the apocryphal, and so I already had insight on what it was that the Sumerians were talking about, but when I uh, started to study and to look into the scripture and the Lord gave me discernment on the the two different creations, that's what made me go back to the text and to look at it a little bit more carefully, uh, especially when, you know, he also awakened me up to the strong delusion and to that which could, you know, um, deceive even the most elect. And so if this is something... This strong delusion is something that would deceive even the most elect. It's going to take very precise study to bring forth this information. And so looking back at the Sumerian text and rereading over that, I found the the two different creations also mentioned within the Sumerian text. And so a lot of people that are, you know, so-called experts on this when they bring this information out and they tell the stories, they'll cite various sources, they will, you know, automatically claim that these Anunnaki are the creators of humanity, uh, the benefactors of humanity, even though it says precisely that they were trying to create a slave race. And they never, ever cite the differences between what is termed in the text as the primitive worker and that uh, which is called civilized man. And so looking, and I want to touch on Genesis chapter 1, just a couple of passages there, just to set up the premise of 
what we're going to go into so people can understand what it is that we're going to be talking about from the biblical standpoint as we merge this with the Sumerian teachings and decipher what has been written by uh, the fallen ones themselves. Um, going to Genesis chapter 1, it says in verse 27, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. Subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. That was, uh, again, the Elohim creation. This is not Yahweh Elohim, so this is not the Most High. This is the Elohim, which are part of the fallen ones, the Anunnaki, that so long ago were cast out. And going to chapter 2 begins... Wait, wait, wait. wait. I got to interject because people will ask a lot of questions about what you just said. Now, sure. so to be clear, so and and I know that you have this in your book. Yes. Okay. As a matter of fact, if I might quote this, it says, "If you look up the translation for God in the prior Genesis passages, one will find that the word God translates as plural Elohim, which, like sons of God." stands for the sum total of angels in both the higher and lower orders. God in these early passages actually represents the angels of God, or the sons of God, in this case the rebel angels that were cast out of their first estate. Now let me ask you a question. Do you believe that in Genesis 1, verse 27, that these that these uh, Elohim, were were fallen at the time that they were creating uh, this man and woman crea- creatures here on Earth. They weren't necessarily fallen to the degree where they, uh, you know, were no longer counted as part of salvation and uh, you know as chance for eternal life. They had not corrupted themselves to the point where they became evil, and it was part of their creating this primitive worker and they're attempting to create this slave race that brought judgment upon them. Oh, okay, because this very closely matches the postulations of, for example, uh, Ken Klein and some other folks out there, uh, Dr. Jerry Lee, uh, which, of course, we don't agree with all of the, you know, none of us agree with 1,000%, you know what I mean? There's always some deviations from what, you know, some of us agree with but and such. But that being said, it, it you know, K- Ken Klein uh, had pointed out in his uh, work that uh, the first couple of verses – of Genesis, when it refers to God, it's actually manifold God or many different types of God. Um, so his his thoughts were that the, these Elohim were actually a type of creator gods. That's what he called it. And that matches interestingly well back to Psalms 82, where our Heavenly Father is standing in the congregation of the mighty in front of the minor gods. I, I found that a real fascinating dot that connected Yes, it's all it's all the same thing. And it also, you know, th- there's other passages in other books which also confirm this, especially the the uh Emerald Tablets of Thoth. They give great detail on how it was that the division later came uh during the time of Atlantis, the separation between the sons of the law, or the sons of light and the sons of Belial or the Sons of Darkness and how the secret societies all came out uh, from that division and how it was that they got caught up in corruption and bringing forth uh, these entities of darkness opening stargates and portals. And it was over the treatment of this primitive worker, um, this you know this creature, because they were treated as uh, econ- as an economic. Uh, commodity more or less and they did not have necessarily rights and so many especially the sons of Belial the sons of darkness treated these individuals in a in a horrific way uh, and even when you read the Sumerian text themselves it talks about the, what is called the house of life and how it was that they had these particular beings uh, in cages and in you know in these they genetically experimented upon them. 
They engaged in direct bestiality. Uh, we know from the the source of Barosis and his account of what they had done prior to the creation of modern uh, Adam and Eve when the demigods, these Anunnaki, were ruling upon the earth, uh, how they had created all kind of hybrid creatures, much like what we hear being done in Dulce in the the deep, you know, underground bases and places called Nightmare Hall and, you know, mm-hmm. where they're doing these genetic experimentations where they're creating these animal-human hybrids and they're mixing, uh, you know, we, we have the account of Thomas Costello, which was one of the guards that worked in this deep underground base and he had uh, he had carried secretly out a uh, 100 pages of, of text and in illustrations, a certain amount of photographs, I believe it was 24 photographs and a seven minute long video. And he made a deal with the person that if he should miss two meetings, uh, that that person make this information available to the public. And when that information came out, of course, it's been, um, you know, criticized and those that have brought this information out, like Branton, he's been locked up, uh, other people that have spoken about this information, Phil Schneider, we know that he is now dead and disappeared and and so but we have confirming witness from from different individuals as to the kind of nightmare scenarios that are going on in these deep underground bases and what people don't realize is that there's nothing new under the sun, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the second coming of the Son of Man. And all of this is being repeated. And and in, that's why we're coming upon harvest, because the Lord's not going to stand for for what they're doing. Uh, the abduction of kids, the way that they're utilizing disappeared people um, to do these experimentations, they're going to be judged again. And so uh, that was... That was why that the father also brought in his own creation was to turn and, and bring upheaval to all that the fallen angels had established during that particular time. Wow, that's that's some pretty dark stuff. Yeah, the uh, I mean, you know, the whole Dulce Costello. Wow. Yeah, I, um, it's fascinating to me how many whistleblowers have come out and. And, uh, well, you know, I told what I believe is the truth. I mean, you, you have debunking or attempts to debunk the information every single time. It doesn't matter if it's the two suns that are being photographed in the sky all over the place or if it's the Nibiru, uh, whatever it is, there's always tons and tons and tons of debunking going on. And I've always wondered, you know, uh, you know, Kenneth and I were speaking about, uh, you know, uh, Bob Lazar earlier today and how you know people can try to debunk Bob Lazar's contention that he re- was hired to reverse engineer alien spacecraft you know what would be the guy's motivation to do that why would he come out and literally destroy his career you know a, a highly highly educated engineering student degrees you know, highly qualified, and why would he come out and just tell everybody a big fat lie? You know, he was motivated to blow the whistle and to tell people what he had seen, yet there are so many people out there that won't believe that Bob Lazar saw alien spacecraft and was hired by the black ops to reverse engineer alien spacecraft, not spacecraft that were designed after Tesla's experiments or the Nazis, but real alien spacecraft. And it's just fascinating how everyone tries to debunk these guys like Costello, uh, Bruce Allen Walton, who you mentioned, Branton, uh, Phil Schneider. How do you debunk these people? Their, Their stories all match, and they're seeing the exact same beings, entities in Dalsi that are reported in the Nagamati codices as archons. Exactly, exactly. And that's why I think that the Lord, uh, the Father, the, our King, and the Son brought forth the information of the Nagamati codices and allowed them to be found in 1945. Because, again, I, I've stated this in other shows, it's my opinion that when when the nation of Israel was brought into being again and when the world knew that this was going to happen, this was a 
a sign to Satan and to the fallen ones that this is the last generation, that, that they have to get busy with their strong delusion, and they have to bring up all these ancient aliens and this information about these ancient aliens so that they can deceive the people and, you know, cause even the most elect to be confused. And so uh, that's why, you know, all the Roswell events and all that began to happen and, you know, UFOs were shot down and back engineered. But the Nag Hammadi Kosices, the Testament of Amram, uh, the Emerald Tablets, all these are ancient texts which confirm the strange accounting of all of these scientists that have come out and basically go in public. Not only have they destroyed their careers, but they put their lives at risk. They destroyed, they destroyed their reputation. They destroyed their own lives. They destroyed their relationships with their family members. They put everything at risk to bring forth this information. And even if they did it for, you know, some monetary gain or whatever. Is that really worth it? No, it isn't. And so people really have to, you know, at they put their lives at the risk of bringing this information out. People should at least open themselves to the possibility of it, entertain it, and look into it, see if there's truth in it or not. Amen. So, so. Tell us about this Enki entity from the Lost Book of Enki. What was his? What you know? I when I when I first read that that snippet from your book where it says, and and if I may, I'm going to read this one more time, and I'm going to read it faster, and I'm going to put a little bit of emotion into it to try to underscore what it looks like on the text. It says, indeed, a wonder of wonders it is. A new breed of Earthling on Earth has emerged. A civilized man has the Earth brought forth. Um, you know, that's hi that seems h highly suspicious to me, particularly when you read the the prelude to this on the, uh, in the prior page of the of the book, the Lost Book of Enki. You see where he basically says that he, as you had pointed out, found a couple of women, uh, you know, slept with them. You know, if he had done those things and ultimately brought forth this quote civilized man as his offspring from sleeping with these women, why would the text sound so amazed? Why would they be, you know, so elated and wanting to tell Anu about this wonderful thing that had happened? You know, it just it doesn't match up. In other words, you know, it, it seems like they're surprised. What is was is that part of what clued you into this being a twist on reality? Yes. In order for me to explain this, I'm going to have to go back to uh, the second part of the Genesis quote that that we were talking about a little bit earlier. This will help to clarify this. Going back to Genesis chapter 2, real quick, it says in verse 5, And there was not a man to till the ground, but there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. There he put the man whom he had formed. This, now, for those that have studied the Sumerian text, that have also studied the, um, the biblical, the Hebraic text from Yahweh Elohim, we know that the word, everything within it, there's prophecies that date back thousands and thousands and thousands of years, and that every one of these prophecies has been fulfilled, and that those that are remaining will also be fulfilled, that the word of the Bible is 100% the word of our Creator, of the Father of us all, and that's why we can you can bank on what it says. And so here's where you have to have the discernment in order to understand what is being portrayed and what is being spoken about in the Sumerian text. Because we know also, according to the word, that all of these other cultures, that the reason that Abraham was brought out of the Sumerian teachings and out of Sumer and Ur was because they worshipped the fallen gods. They were idolaters. And we know... 
according to the text again, that all of the other cultures, all of the other civilizations, all of these other um, cultures that were brought up by the feathered serpent or Quetzalcoatl or, uh, you know, the different embodiments of whom we know as Enki. Yeah, the serpents of wisdom. Yeah, Yeah. the serpents. That book, The Serpents of Wisdom, talks about how these these serpent creatures, these shape-shifting Anunnaki in Atlantis and Lemuria, branched out and spread across the earth and, and created all these different civilizations. Right. And they did this to set themselves up as God. And they brought the worship that was, you know, supposedly for the Most High – because that's the only true worship, that's the only true religion there is, is worship of the Most High as the creator of us all. But they brought themselves up as gods, and they also, in mating with and also being, you know, engaging in direct bestiality, that they brought up a certain group of elect, um, the remnant uh, for, for their their priesthood and the people that, they were involved in their own particular bloodlines that they utilized these bloodlines to rule over these different cultures and these different civilizations and that they utilized their mythology and their technology, their, their, the wisdom that they shared, that they deceived the masses. And they deceived the masses in such a way that they caused them to even sacrifice their own children. All right, that being said, going to the text and what is explained in Genesis chapter 3, that once you understand that Enki is Samael, is Satan now, is uh, the fallen Lucifer, is, it's the, all the same embodiment and that he is also connected to Poseidon, connected to Oanes, connected to Dagon, all these different um, fallen gods are the same embodiments. The serpent in the garden is Anki, is um, Samael, is the feathered serpent. And so we know that according to Genesis 6, I mean Genesis chapter 3, and also Genesis chapter 1 and 2, that the father is the one that created modern Adam and Eve with a living soul, and that this particular creature that he brought about has chance for salvation and eternal life. And so understanding that and going back and reading the text, yes, then it makes sense that all of a sudden this civilized man appeared on you know, on the planet and even though Enki speaks about how he all of a sudden, you know, he was just flying around in a spaceship, he spotted these two women on the ground, he went down and had sex with both of them. He says that he created Adapa, not Adam, Adapa, who was the male, uh, and then Tiamat, who was the female. And he says that these two particular beings were, you know, as a result of his direct fornication with these particular creatures. Now, where did these two women all of a sudden come about? You know, so you have to have discernment when you're reading this text because we know that Enki is the father of lies, too, and that he will sway and relate a story the way he wants it to appear for his own glorification. And I will give you an example of this. When his son, Marduk, came to power, came to um, and was given authority over the Anunnaki, they actually changed the Enuma Elish, the original Babylonian and Akkadian uh, creation tales to reflect that Marduk was the one that had slayed Tiamat. And, mm-hmm. and, and, but what people don't realize is that the Enuma Elish in the original text, they're actually talking about the creation of the solar system and that those particular gods and minor gods and deities that are spoken about are the planets when they came in conflict with each other. And so Marduk is attributing, and and all the Anunnaki, they went along with this, and they gave him full credit. Um, They're saying that Marduk 
the son of Enki, you know, which he wasn't even around during this time, um, it was the one they attribute him as being Nibiru and being the one that slayed Tiamat. And we know that Tiamat is the planet that used to be where um, the asteroid belt now is. And that Marduk was not the one that did that, but Nibiru, the planet Nibiru, the 12th planet, is the one, one of its moon, moons struck Tiamat and split her in half. And it was on the next orbit that Tiamat, the remnant, the carcass of that planet, was moved to where the Earth is now. And that began, you know, life here on this planet. That's also spoken about in Genesis chapter 4 with the, the division of the waters and the separation of the firmament. And that was a celestial event. But yet, after Marduk came to power, all of the different cultures and civilizations of the world that were idolaters and worshipped these pagan gods, they changed their stories and they changed their mythology to reflect that Marduk was the greatest of these you know, minor gods. And so when you read the various Sumerian texts and also the various, you know, the different Hindu texts, the Roman, the Greek, the mythologies that are coming out there, you can't rely 100% on what is being said because the stories are changed and 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 even when they are first written down you're not 100% sure that that's the way things occurred and so here's where you have to have the discernment and so when you align the word and what is written in Genesis chapter 1 2 3 the unfolding of you know humanity uh even speaking about the Elohim and how they had created uh, this primitive worker, all of this is within the text, but you have to have the discernment to realize that the Father attributes the creation of modern humanity, the civilized man, to himself and to Yahushua, the Word, the, the Holy Trinity, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit, and that they, you know, that's where we came from. And so, when you realize that and you real and you read this and this, the differences between what is cited as the primitive worker and cited as the civilized man then it makes sense and according to the sumerian text and what they write themselves their primitive worker the creature that they had been working on uh for a long period of time that even though they reached a certain degree of of technology or civility with this particular creature, it still could not speak. It did not. It did not. Uh, it was not involved in domesticating animals. It did not uh, work the ground. It did not, uh, you know, bring forth agriculture in such way. And it even speaks about in the Sumerian text how this particular their primitive worker, when you know, when they began to multiply how it was that the Anunnaki began to starve because there was not enough food for them and this creature that was getting out of hand. And we know this creature as being, you know, Cro-Magnon, Neanderthal, uh, the Bigfoot types, those that were not of modern humanity. And when the Lord brought us on the scene, as I said earlier, it was be, it was to serve as a condemnation for what the fallen ones had done and it would also serve as chance for us to be redeemed and for us to have part in salvation because there would be those from you know also of the Elohim of the sons of God in whatever capacity that we served in the first world age during our spiritual lives where we're, whether we were part of the rebellion or part of the elect that fought for the most high or those that made no decision one way or the other, that just watch the unfoldment. Here in the flesh, all of us would be given chance to be redeemed and to have salvation because the Father would send his own Son to incarnate into this creature that he had created. And that his coming into the flesh, defeating death, and bringing salvation and eternal life is what would bring final judgment 
to the fallen ones for all that they had done, and also to us as uh, you know, spiritual beings incarnated in, in the human experience, that we would also be given a chance for redemption and salvation. And so this was the whole plan and the reason why the Lord allowed things to unfold as they did. Wow, and um, and Kenneth has a, one queued up, but real quick, so to recap uh, for folks, if you, in case you didn't know or, or you didn't catch it, this is powerful, folks. Okay, in the lost book of Enki, as this uh, fallen being uh, is, uh, you know, making a big deal about uh, this civilized man, that he even goes to say that the earth itself had brought forth. I find that fascinating because he, on one hand, he claims that he was the creator of it, and then later he says a civilized man has the earth itself brought forth. So that implies that he was telling a naughty little fib. And then um, the next sentence, and this is powerful, folks, because this is where it correlates back to the word of God, our Heavenly Father. Uh, Yahweh Elohim, Lord God Elohim, the Most High God, the Great El Elyon, the Father of our King Jesus Christ. Okay, and here it says in the very next line, listen to this, quote, farming and shepherding, crafts and tool making can he be taught. Okay, this is from the Lost Book of Enki. Farming and shepherding and crafts and tool making can he be taught. Now, why is that powerful? Because as Zen pointed out, turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 2, verse 5, and at the very last part of that verse it says, And there was no man to till the ground. Imagine bingo. that, folks. That's a huge bingo, folks, because you've got man and woman creatures created by manifold God, Elohim, creator gods, arguably, okay, that, that you know, had dominion over all the animals of the earth and all this other stuff, right? But those men and women creatures did not have the skills to till the ground, which is proven by Genesis 2, 5b, and there was no man to till the ground, which matches... The Lost Book of Enki. Praise God. That's powerful, Zen. I, I, I have never seen that before. Yeah, that was one of the, the keys for me, you know, in, in coming to understand and have discernment on all this. There's also a particular passage, uh, and this is in the Lost Book of Enki, it says this. Intelligence they possess, this is speaking about uh, the primitive worker, uh, um, I mean, of uh, uh, the civil, I'm, let me just read it. Intelligence they possessed of commands they had understanding. They took over all manner of chores. Unclothed they were the task performing. Males with females among them were constantly mating. Quick were their proliferations. In one shower, sometimes four, sometimes more, were their generations. As the earthlings grew in numbers, workers the Anunnaki had. With food, the Anunnaki were not satiated. In the cities and in the orchards, in the valleys and in the hills, the earthlings for food were constantly foraging. This, these primitive workers, they did not have the capacity at that time to work agriculture or to domesticate animals. All that had not yet been possible until the civilized man was brought on the board. It, it also says this, in those days, grains had not yet been brought forth. There was no you. A lamb had not yet been fashioned. About these matters, Enlil to angry, angry words was saying. So speaking about the same thing that we were talking about. Wow. Kenneth? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, say, Zen, it's so exciting every time you're on here. And uh, what you just brought brought to light there in Genesis chapter 2, verse 5, is so exciting to finally become aware of. And then right before it, I wanted to just mention in verse 4, before I ask you a question, you know, you get a lot of people that teach the Bible and take the more conservative approach that, oh, Genesis 1 is just another way of saying the story in Genesis 2, but then they can't account for what it says in Genesis 4, the fact that these are the generations of the heavens and the earth, and when they were created in the day of the Lord, God made the earth and the heavens. I mean, it's like he's just recapping God's recapping in his word right there what he just got done telling you in Genesis 1. But uh, what I wanted to ask you, Zen, is when you finally started to have this stuff become apparent to you, 
And and I, I'll tell you what it did to me. It made me so much more comfortable with the science and the archaeology that's out there. And we can't deny Krogh Magnog Man and all these other like ancient archaeological finds. But did you ever stop and think? Like with Darwin and all these people that uh, try to make this fossil record uh, support evolution, you ever think they were in on the the conspiracy, so to speak, or do you think they just never even understood any of this stuff? Do you no, ever have any thoughts were, on that? They were absolutely in on the conspiracy. The the Luciferians, the Satanists, the Freemasons, they have a a lot of the secrets. They understand. They know about Cain. They know about these these different things. They know that they're from the fallen ones, and that you know their their bloodlines are descended from these fallen beings. They know that their god is Lucifer, and they know that their father is, is Satan, the fallen one. They know all these things. It, it, they put them out in their books. They're not trying to hide anything. Uh, even though the Freemason books, you know, are not for the regular masses, and and when the Mason dies, they're supposed to turn in all of their texts back to the different lodges. They have, for hundreds, thousands of years, kept these things secret and kept them from the people. And yes, that's why the Smithsonian has spirited away all of the findings that go against Darwinism. Uh, you know, skulls with horns on them, giant bones and bodies. You know, the fact that the Bible mentions the giants as being the children of the fallen ones and that, you know, the the earth and the archaeology, it also reflects you know, giants have been found everywhere on every, you know, continent in most of the countries of the world and are still being discovered. And that is also verification of the word. It gives confirmation to Numbers 13, Deuteronomy. You know, when Moses sent the spies into the land and they gave a report of the land being uh, filled with giants that were cannibals that, you know, that ate the flesh of humanity. All these things are in the word. They're hidden within the word. And they're being confirmed by not only the archaeology, but all of the ancient texts that are also coming out that are uh, being you know being released, the one thing is that so many people and so many well studied i mean and just respectful individuals they accept the the lies of these uh, of these particular fallen beings they accept what the you know the the idolaters say, and and without ever questioning, without ever looking, they don't look at the Hebraic text. They don't even study it because they, they you know, they consider uh, Yahweh Elohim, Yahuwah, the Father, the Creator. Um, they teach that this is Enlil, and they teach that Anki is Satan, and that just it just blows me away. And I, you know, I've also spoke about that confusion as well and clarified that for people that don't know Enlil is not Yahweh is not Yahuwah Enlil is Zeus and Enki is Poseidon and they're both part of the Roman the fallen pantheon of gods they're brothers uh, Poseidon and Zeus were brothers it, so you know it's important that people get clarity on all of this Otherwise, they're going to believe that strong delusion that is going to cause so many to, you know, to believe this lie. Let me, uh, uh, Ken, um, Ken, uh, Kenneth, you you have another comment, uh, but real fast, yep. Zen. Yeah, I, I got. I, I'm curious, Zen. What do you think? I've actually had somebody email me, and they felt that it was okay to believe. And Jesus is their Lord and Savior, but that the Anunnaki created men. Do you think our Heavenly Father will allow that and that that person will make it into heaven? What are your thoughts about that? That's idolatry. You're given the credit of the creation of humanity, which is one of the most glorious uh, things that the Father and the Son and the Holy Trinity ever did. You're giving that credit to the to the fallen angels and to the idolaters, and, and you're diminishing what he says within his word and the truth that he's brought forth. Do you think that's okay? I don't think so. 
Yeah, I don't think so either. Praise Jesus. Go ahead, Kenneth. Hey, Van, I just wanted to say amen to what you said about the um, the Masons and all the secret societies. You know, they, they have a doctrine they call on becoming, and they do teach Lucifer as their god, and we're evolving to gods. Um, right. I wanted to just also say that they found a, a burial mound. I'm going to post a link for everybody in the um, chat room. Um, there was a burial mound found just about three hours east of me here. And it's kind of exciting where I live because we've got the, the giants of uh, Pontiac County north of me here a couple hours, and then east of me in Bradford County. Um, I'm sorry, that's northeast of me. Um, they found back in the 1880s these, these human skulls with horns protruding out of them. And right. there was a professor named A.B. Skinner and um, another professor named Donahue who discovered these things from the Phillips Academy. I'm going to post a link to it. I mean, this is this is documented fact. They actually have photographs of these things. So amen to what you said, brother. Amen. Hey, would, John, would you mind if I shared this one question that a listener had sent? Because uh, I think it's relevant for our conversation. Please. Uh, it says this, and this is um, a question that was sent to me. If the primitive worker was the first man and woman spoken about in Genesis – and that you spoke about them as being, quote, unable to understand the secrets of heaven, how is it that although, quote, they had the assistance of the fallen ones, that later were able to develop complex and highly organized societies? I thought this was a really good question. And this is how it is even today, people, for you to understand this. The, the fallen ones, when they bred in with not only their own primitive workers – but also with civilized humanity, remember the sons of God mating with the daughters of man, that it was through that hybrid line that they controlled the masses, that they utilized divine right to rule to impose their will and to control and to gear us to what is the new world order or global government, and that they've been doing this ever since, even before, Humanity, modern humanity was created, and that's how they do it even now. They breed in that they are reincarnating into these royal lines, and that as the Emerald Tablets of Thoth say, they rule over the councils of men, that they crept in to the councils of men, took over the rulers that, you know, the these particular bloodline royal elites – that that's how they rule over humanity even to this day. They just control those that impose the will on humanity. These royal lines, um, you know, Bush and uh, Queen Elizabeth and all those that are sitting on the thrones of the world today, it's the same thing as going back to the time of Pharaoh, to the time of, you know, the priesthood that demanded blood sacrifice to Quetzalcoatl and uh, to Moloch and you know demanding um, that they people sacrifice their children, that's how it is that they have controlled us ever since the beginning. Yeah, amen. And and so let me get you to comment. I'd like to play this audio clip because this is directly related to what you just said. Because I've always, well, not lately, but years ago, I used to struggle with how how could civilizations thousands of years old say things that were you know that they you know for example the mayans believed well listen to this clip just listen to this clip now never mind the date that is uh, espoused here in this particular clip this is uh from from uh from an old a 1970s show uh, uh hosted by leonard nimoy about the Mayan mysteries. It's a show called In Search Of. Okay, this is an audio snippet called Mayan Mysteries. Now, this is an actual, uh, this is actually one of the Mayan ancient prophecies uh, that they were uh, given from these star gods, from these uh, alien Anunnaki from the heavens they came, beings that taught them things, taught them to kill babies and to drink blood and all that kind of stuff. Okay, listen to this clip. This is powerful because it in 6 verse 12, the opening of the sixth seal where it says, and I looked and there was a sixth seal and behold, there was a great earthquake. Uh, and, then, uh, and then you have 
the new men of knowledge, that would be the Galactic Federation of Lies, the Anunnaki star gods manifesting in the strong delusion, coming back to set up the Revelation 13 beast government. Would you comment on that? Yeah, this has been revealed to us in so many ways. Even when Credo Mutwa, um, and from the quote from my book, he speaks about this too. The the quote from the Emerald Tablets of Thought, they also speak about this. All of this is being set up. It's the strong delusion. These new men of knowledge are the Anunnaki, and the, the ancient alien series is setting them up as our creators, as our benefactors. And you have great people that are well studied, like you know individuals like Michael Tellinger, like um, Jack Pruitt. Uh, you know guys, I, I complete re respect in their study and the work that they're doing, but they also teach that. You know, these Anunnaki, these fallen ones, these Elohim, that they are the creators of humanity. And they fully accept the premise of those things that have been written about, the, that have been passed down through the, the different pagan nations, the different idolatrous texts. Uh, listen to this. This is from the Emerald Tablets of Thoth. It says this. Then shall there come unto man the great warfare that shall make the earth tremble and shake in its course. A, then shall the dark brothers open the warfare between light and the night. When man again shall conquer the ocean and fly in the air on wings like the birds, when he has learned to harness the lightning, then shall the time of warfare begin. Great shall the battle be twixt the forces. Great the warfare of darkness and light. Nations shall rise against nation, using the dark forces to shadow the earth. Weapons of force shall wipe out the earth. Men until half of the races of men shall be gone. Then shall come forth the sons of the morning and give their edict to the children of men, saying, O men, cease from thy striving against thy brother. Only thus can ye come to the light. Cease from thy unbelief, O my brother, and follow the path, and know ye are right. I mean, there's so much. Real quick, another um, passage from Krita Mutwa. He says this, But when the Chittauri arrived in Africa, they told our people that they were gods, and that they were going to give us human beings great gifts on one condition. We had to worship them, and accept them as our creators. Some told our people that they were our elder brothers, and that this earth had produced them generations ago, and they said they had come back to the green womb of their mother, and that they were going to make us into gods. That's wow. powerful stuff. Wow. Yeah, first one, Zen. I just have to comment here real quick. When man shall learn again to fly, you know, I'm paraphrasing it, but wow, what's with that? That right. was powerful. Yeah, I mean, and this is from a text that's, you know, supposedly 25,000 B.C. You know, when men again shall conquer the ocean and fly in the air on wings like the birds. That's amazing. Um, Wow. The, the I, I got to get you to comment on this. Because uh, you know, I would I would I would hold you up as you know the for I, I believe you're the foremost expert, arguably the only expert that understands you know these these Earth ages, the ages of the Earth, you know where we are in this you know overall uh, grand procession or the big ending that we're heading toward with the Great Tribulation and and um, folks, on Wednesday we're going to cover uh, basically there was a broadcast on. Coast to Coast AM called Liberation of the Planet, uh, and we're gonna we're gonna cover we're gonna play a couple of audio snippets from that, and um, we're gonna discuss them in a roundtable with uh, Rebecca Michaels. Praise Jesus for her work, and um, but here's the thing, and and this is where I'd like to get you to comment. And in this, you know, unfortunate misgiving of these, um, I I would submit alien abductee microchipped individuals who were commandeered at a very young age. Um, they, uh, in this diatribe regarding this concept of liberating the planet, which, by the way, is really the 
the evolution or the uh, bringing forth of the new men of knowledge uh, to create a global government, the new world order, the Revelation 13 beast government. Now, they said that these uh, star gods, the, they didn't call them star gods, they called them the federation, the federation of uh, planets, the, the galactic federation, said that this was the last place, this earth, this earth right now, the, you know, the question that was asked by uh, the host of the show, it wasn't George Norrie, it was somebody else, was why earth, why now? And their answer was that all of these alien races from all over the universe were kind of, you know, coming to earth for this big final showdown between good versus evil and 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 in the context of earth ages can you explain to the listeners what they might have been referring to why the focus on the earth i'll tell you why cuz um cuz satan the fallen one the anunnaki the second world age began with the fall of adam and eve the creation of modern humanity and our our collective incarnation into the flesh as the sons of God, that this would be where harvest, judgment, the separation of the wheat and the tares, the goat and the sheep, the left from the right, all that would happen here. Why the focus on the earth? Because they've been banished here. They no longer have chance to escape. They they want to escape judgment. They're seeking a way out, but the Father is going to bring final judgment to them and to us uh, as humanity for the things that we do. And that's why it's important for you to understand what it is, why it is that the strong delusion, it's important for you to learn about these particular beings. You do not want to get caught up in believing that they are your creators or that they are your God. Because you're going to follow them into the judgment that is coming upon them. They have been banished. They abandoned their first estate. And we are going to be the inheritors of those, of that, of their, you know, the commission, the positions that they abandoned a long time ago. And so it's all happening here. It's all unfolding here. We're the last generation. Since the recreation of Israel, the fig tree generation, everybody knows. The universe knows. Everybody's watching the earth because this is where we're at the culmination. This is the climax. This is the end game. And it's all being fold, unfolded in our lifetimes. And we are privileged to be part of it and to, have, to bear witness to it and to have a chance to be good foot washers, to be good watchmen, to sound the trumpet, <clears throat> to bring forth the warning, and to share our own testimony so that we can bring people to remembrance on who they are, why they're here, on their own fall, on the original sin, the angel wars that led to all of us incarnating in the flesh now. What all of this is about is so very important because the war in heaven it's occurring within the temple of our own bodies, within our own. Amen. Yeah, amen. And folks, to to body slam home this point, and this is just absolutely jaw dropping. Um, most of the advanced uh, Christian researchers in this realm don't understand how thorough this deception is, how unbelievably thorough the deception is, okay? Many of them will draw a line and, oh, these have to be interdimensional entities. The Earth's only 6,000 years old. I can't find it in the King James, so it can't be true. You know, you get a lot of that kind of stuff out there. Okay, now listen to this. Phyllis Schlemmer wrote, she she was a channeler, okay, that, that channeled these beings, you know, communicated with them in whatever way that they communicate, okay, and this is back in the 60s, she, I believe, is still around today, okay, and back in the 60s, she was meeting with, uh, with, um, uh, 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 the, the, uh, the, uh, the founder, if you will, of the Star Trek series, um, I'm forgetting his name for some reason, but anyway, um, but the whole Star Trek thing 
was uh, they had met all of these people, Phyllis Schlemmer and these different people from Hollywood, had gotten together and talked to these entities. She had written a book, uh, Gene Roddenberry was one of the people, and there were others, okay? And they had met and channeled these beings, <clears throat> these beings, for a long time. And the information that these beings gave Miss Schlemmer was compiled into a book. Believe it or not, the book was entitled The Only Planet of Choice. The Only Planet of Choice. But what's absolutely astonishing is in the, uh, in the very beginning of the book, these entities identify themselves as the Elohim from the ancient Hebrew text. <laughs> If that isn't enough to make your mouth dislocate and your jaw hit the ground, then you're not paying attention, folks. These, this is precisely what Zen just pointed out in Genesis 1. This is precisely what these entities claim to be, except they're fallen Elohim. They're fallen Ben Yeha Elohim, praise Jesus. Can, uh, would you care to comment on that, Zen? I think you said it uh, perfect, brother. Uh, very well said. And I think you've come um, full circle on this, John. I know that it was, you know, initially confusing when we first began to to speak about these things, but uh, I believe your discernment is right on with it. Yeah, praise God. And um, and uh, it, uh, Kenneth, did you have anything you wanted to toss over the wall? No, I'm just enjoying listening to it. Praise God for this opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Praise Jesus. Re one one last thing before we wrap up. Um, I, I wanted to read this quote. It's another quote from the uh, uh, Vat. Um, uh, gosh, the book uh, Ex Exicana Vaticana or whatever that they're writing um, uh, uh, that is currently being done with uh, Chris Putnam and Tom Corn uh, Tom Horn. And again, it's uh, Exo Vaticana is the name of the book, and a quote from the third. Uh, excerpt that they published on their website. Let me read this quote. I'd like to see if you, what your thoughts are on this, because I found this rather amazing. It says, quote, this is right out of the book. It says, uh, regarding the Vatican's infrared telescope refer called Lucifer, it says, then, and then there is that Lucifer device on Mount Graham, which the Vatican denies being connected to, but we shall illustrate otherwise later in this series. Lucifer is curiously described on the Vatican Observatory website as, quote, NASA and the Vatican's infrared telescope, Lucifer, a German-built, NASA and the Vatican-owned and funded infrared telescope, which is looking for Nibiru slash Nemesis. And then it goes on to say, this is where it gets really interesting. Why has the Vatican Observatory website allowed this caption to remain. Nibiru and Nemesis are hypothetical planets that supposedly return in orbit to the Earth after a very long period of time. They have been connected in modern myth with Planet X and most darkly with the destruction this is this is critical with the destruction of planets that some believe occurred in a great war between God and Lucifer when the powerful angel was cast out of heaven. And then they go on to say, in the book of Job, where the prophet details how God destroyed the literal dwelling places of the angels that made insurrection against him. He refers to Job 26, 11 through 13. And it says it specifically mentions the destruction of Rahab, a planetary body, also known as pride, from which God drove the fugitive snake. Can, I'd like to hear your comment on Planet X. How it would, how you, I mean, how does this all map back? This Job twenty six eleven through thirteen, the destruction of the planet Rahab that's in our Holy Bible, and how does that all map back to the Sumerian stuff? Okay, this this is tied to Ezekiel chapter 28 when it speaks of Lucifer going uh, among the, the stones of fire, which are the planets. And we knew that he had established an economic system where he had trade established among these various planets. And at that particular time, 
he indeed had his base on what was referred to as Rahab in Job. I explained wow. this in, in my book. This is what I speak about where the Enuma Elish is talking about Nibiru, Planet X, as initially being captured by the net force of our outer solar planets, and that once Nibiru, and this was, you know, the Lord was using this planet as a judgment against what would be referred to as Tiamat. Tiamat is the same thing as Rahab. So no way. Lucifer, yeah, the same thing as Rahab. <laughs> That's awesome. Praise Jesus. <laughs> yeah, and so Lucifer had his base on that planet that used to be where the asteroid belt is now. And the Lord used one of the moons of Nibiru to shatter that planet and to destroy it. And not only that, but he used the carcass of that planet to reform and to recreate the new earth, Ki, what, what the Sumerians call. And so that's when life began on this particular planet. The Lord moved the carcass of Tiamat, uh, switched, um, switched places with Mars, and, and the Earth then became the new focus and the new chapter of the unfolding of what was the multiplicity of life. And that's when the, the whole focus on this planet really began. And that's what it's talking about. Yes, the destruction of Tiamat, the destruction of Rahab, was a judgment against the fallen ones. That was the destruction of the first world age, as spoken about in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23 and on. Wow, praise God. That's awesome. Yeah, it's just a, it's such a blessing when you can take all of these ancient writings and um, and correlate them and move them back into the Holy Bible and see how unbelievably close they are to the truth. Um, it, it, that's one of the reasons why I, I always, you know, struggle when I listen to some of these other um, authors out there, um, you know, postulate in their writings about, you know, the, you know, they always have this. It always seems that they have kind of a line in the sand somewhere where they they can only go, they can only let their sanctified imagination allow them to go so far, and then they just have to draw draw this line, and they won't accept that maybe, just maybe, 99% of this stuff that these devils are telling people is the truth, and it's just that 1% lie that's necessary to demote Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father, Yahweh. Amen. That's what they do. That is, they will give their, you know, the worship and the praise to themselves. They they don't want people to know about the Creator, nor His Son, nor His role, and why it was that He had to come into the flesh. And they create Babel. They create confusion. They put out you know the various different doctrines to contradict themselves just to create confusion among the masses so that people won't study one way or the other, even you know the 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 gospel or even the word. Uh, most people will not even read the Holy Bible, much less the full summation of all of these texts together. But once you do, um, if you, and I know most people don't have the time, and, you know, everybody's so busy just trying to survive, but that if a person did, and there's a lot of people that have embarked on this, when you read all these texts together, it just confirms the relevancy of the gospel. The Father has all of the secrets intertwined and veiled within his word. And when you have the eyes to see, the ears to hear, and the mind to understand, all the secrets are revealed. So in the context, in closing, in the context of um, you know, this whole Psalms 82, God standing in the congregation of the mighty, uh, you know, uh, casting judgment on these minor gods, um, that they shall die like men, Ultimately incarnate into the Adamic bloodline at, 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 at you know at, at conception, uh, just like the Cathars believed, and and you know that we were spirits that had fallen into you know kind of a, a type of judgment in in the flesh human body, um, but in the context of this great and grandiose 
uh, amazing movie, as Pastor Francis Chan calls it, um, that, of, of our Heavenly Father. Um, and, and could you tell the listening audience, you know, where, why, where, what, where does Jesus, where does Yeshua, where does he fit into this whole thing? How, how does that work into the big picture? All right. When you go and you read um, the Gospel of Bartholomew, there, ba- uh, Bartholomew questions Satan about his fall. And he speaks about how he was the first archangel created. But he says that the Son had preexisted him and that it was the Son and the Father that brought forth even Lucifer and the fallen angels, the Elohim. So you have to realize that the Father and the Son are the God of gods. They are those that have authority even um, you know, among the sons of God, among the fallen Elohim, even the, the regular Elohim. They are the Morning Star administration. They are the creator. The word is the the physical expression of the Father, the verbal expression of the Father, and he and the Father are one. They are the creator. So you have to know that Yahushua is the light of the entire universe and that without him we could not even see that when it speaks about his being crowned and brought forth in dominion and given authority and kingship over the entire creation, that that began with the separation of light and darkness. That when the Father said, let there be light, this was when Yahushua was revealed to the sons of God. In the book of the bee, it speaks about how the sons of God, uh, including us, that there was a time... uh, after, you know, when we first came to thought and we had pre-existent thought, where we sat in darkness, we sat in pause, what was called a, a momentary pause within the creation, and that we as the sons of God heard the Father say, let there be light, and that was when Yahushua was revealed to us. That's when we also realized that the voice of the Father that had called forth his Son and given dominion to Yahushua, that that was the creator, and that was the father of us all. And he was revealing his son, who is the Christ, who is the king uh, of the entire universe to us. And that was the moment when the sons of God shouted for joy, because the whole universe was revealed to us. And that's also the moment when Lucifer became jealous. He was envious, and he says this. He wanted to put his throne in the sides of the north. He wanted to be like the Most High. He wanted to be as the morning star, as the sun, and he rebelled, and he took one-third of the angels with him. That began the rebellion, the war in heaven. That's the original sin. We were part of all of that, not necessarily the rebellion. Some of us were. Whatever capacity it is that we served during the First World Age— We find ourselves incarnated into flesh now. And all of these things that I said previously, they have direct reflection on why it is that we are in the flesh now. And it is also why it is that Christ took on the flesh, came into the flesh, and brought redemption to this world. And it wasn't until he died on the cross that even the patriarchs were taken back into paradise in the first resurrection. And so it's important to know your creator and his son because he is the savior of humanity. He is the savior and the giver of eternal life and salvation to those whom he extends salvation to. And that, you know, live righteously and according to his laws and commandments and edicts, prove themselves worthy of being counted among the elect. Wow. So so then John one John one one through uh verse four or I'm sorry, verse five, you could pretty much probably read it then like this. In the beginning was the word Jesus, and the word Jesus was with God, and the word Jesus was God. He was in the beginning with God, 
And all things were made through him, Jesus, and without him nothing that was made uh, nothing was made that was made. In him, Jesus, was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shined in the darkness, but the darkness did not comprehend it. So then we, as a condition, have to accept the price that Jesus paid by dying on the cross, God in the flesh, who rose again three days later and ascended into heaven to sit by the right hand of God the Father, our Heavenly Father, Yahweh, Lord God Elohim, God of gods, Yahweh El, the mighty El Elyon. And we have to spiritually discern in our hearts, hear the knock of Jesus and our Father calling, and recognize that Jesus is our Lord and Savior as a condition of our redemption as a condition of our salvation. Would that be right? Amen. Absolutely. And yes, John chapter 1 lays it all out precisely. Praise God. All right, amen. So we're going to go ahead and wrap the show up. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this opportunity to get together with Brother Zen, with Brother Kenneth, with Kathy in the chat room, all the people that are regulars with the show, and all the new people that are just hearing this, Father. I pray that their their spiritual eyes are open, that their ears are open, that their heart is open, that they are able to discern and feel the Holy Spirit move upon them, move upon them with the way, the truth, and the life. For no one comes unto the Father but by the Lord Jesus, Father God. And we just ask that you just open their hearts. We thank you for this opportunity to be with you, Father God. Lord, open these hearts and witness to them the glory of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, our King Jesus. Thank you, Zen, for being here. Amen. <laughs>